And now on to our dinosaur of the day, Dilophosaurus, which we're revisiting. This was a request from Steve21 via our Patreon and Discord, so thanks. Dilophosaurus was our dinosaur of the day way back in episode 18. And it's definitely time to revisit because there was an updated description that came out in 2020 by Adam Marsh and Timothy Rowe. Dilophosaurus was a theropod that lived in the early Jurassic in what's now Arizona in the U.S., the Cayenta Formation. As a theropod, it walked on two legs, it had a long tail, long arms, sharp teeth, and the thing that sets it apart is the two crests on its head. Thus the Dilophosaurus. Yes. It was also much larger than how it was depicted in Jurassic Park, and like you said earlier, Garrett, it didn't have that frill. That is, I think, the only example I know of, of a dinosaur that was bigger in real life than it was in Jurassic Park. Usually the Jurassic Park dinosaurs are like 50% bigger than they were in real (laughs) life, but not Dilophosaurus. The real one is like two to three times as big. Yes. Although it could have been a baby, I suppose. Could be a baby, yeah. Got big display structures for a baby, if that's the case in Jurassic Park. But even without the frill in real life, Dilophosaurus did look fierce. It was slender and lightly built, estimated to be about 23 feet or 7 meters long and weigh about 880 pounds or 400 kilograms. So way too big to be in that front seat of Nedry's car. (laughs) Yeah, (laughs) too big to fit in anything except for like a school bus, basically. (laughs) There was a histology study in 1996 that found that Dilophosaurus grew 66 to 77 pounds or 30 to 35 kilograms per year early on. It had a woven structure in its bones that showed that it grew quickly. So again, it walked on two legs, and it was active. It had powerful arms and four fingers on each hand, with a large claw on its first fingers. There were smaller claws on the middle fingers, and a vestigial fourth finger. It had large thigh bones, stout feet, and large claws on the toes. It kept its first toe, the hallux, off the ground. The third toe was the stoutest one. It had hollow light vertebrae, a long flexible neck, a large delicate skull, and a narrow snout. And of course, it had the pair of arched crests on its skull that were probably covered in keratin in life, so they would have been even bigger. Yeah. And the description of it as being sort of lightly built, but having like four fingers, a lot of it sounds very strange. That's because it's from the early Jurassic. And most of the predatory dinosaurs we talk about are from the Cretaceous, maybe the late Jurassic, but early Jurassic isn't where we talk about a lot of dinosaurs from. This is much earlier than a lot of other dinosaurs. And even though it was only 23 feet long, it was pretty huge for its time, especially for a predator. Oh, yeah. The paleo artist Brian Eng reconstructed Dilophosaurus based on Marsh and Rose paper and mentioned that, yes, it had weird proportions. He also mentioned we don't know the true crest shape because we don't know what the top of it looked like. Yeah, we're sort of missing the tops. We do know Dilophosaurus had an upper jaw with a gap or kink below the nostril. You can see this in other dinosaurs, though, including coelophysoids. And spinosaurus. Hmm. It also had powerful jaws, a slender, delicate front of the upper jaw, though, and then was deep in the back, and had long, curved, thin teeth. Most of the teeth were serrated. In 2018, Center and Sullivan studied the range of motion for Dilophosaurus arms and found that it could grip and hold objects, as well as bring objects to its mouth and swing its arms and scratch its chest or belly. (laughs) That's important. Yeah. What if it gets itchy? (laughs) A Dilophosaurus may have gone after large animals, as well as eaten smaller animals and fish. There's been a lot of debate about how and what it ate. Sam Wells, who named Dilophosaurus, found it did not have a powerful bite and was probably a scavenger. He also saw Dilophosaurus as active and using its arms as weapons with hands that could grasp and slash. Bob Bogger later found with its large neck and skull and large teeth that it could go after large prey. Gregory Paul also suggested that Dilophosaurus hunted large animals and could also go after smaller animals. A study in 2005 found that the front of the jaws had a strong bite, so it could use those to subdue prey. And then the stress on the jaws was consistent with struggling small prey. So maybe it slashed prey to wound it and then captured the prey in the front of its jaws. And then the prey may have moved to the back of the jaws where the largest teeth were and they were killed by the slicing bites. In 2007, Milner and Kirkland suggested Dilophosaurus ate fish based on the ends of the jaws that formed this rosette of interlocking teeth, similar to Spinosaurids, which we think eat fish. Both Dilophosaurus and Spinosaurus had long arms and well-developed claws, which could help them catch fish, and nasal openings that were retracted, which might have helped keep water out while fishing. 
In 1990, Stephen and Sylvia Circus suggested Dilophosaurus had an aquatic lifestyle with a weak pelvis that needed the water to help support its weight. <laughs> Though they didn't think it only lived in water. Interesting. I think they're in the minority. <laughs> yeah. The old sauropods need to live in water comes to mind. Yeah. Marsh and Rowe in 2020 suggested that Dilophosaurus could prey on large animals, though it may have also eaten fish and small prey. They suggested the premaxilla and maxilla of the upper jaw was not mobile and more robust than previously thought, and Dilophosaurus could have grasped animals with its arms while hunting and scavenging. There's some large tooth marks found on the sauropodomorph Ceratosaurus that's thought to be from Dilophosaurus because the tooth marks match the, the right size for that dinosaur. Yeah, because again, there were not a lot of other large predatory dinosaurs in the early Jurassic. Yes. Not a lot of options for big tooth marks. <laughs> Brown and Rowe in 2021 said Dilophosaurus could puncture bone with its jaws. They also found it had unidirectional breathing like birds where air flows in and out of the lungs. And that means it had a high metabolism. It was probably fast and agile. So they thought Dilophosaurus was an apex predator, not a scavenger. The crests of Dilophosaurus, they start as low ridges at the front of the skull, and then they get higher and plate-shaped toward the roof of the skull. Yeah, a lot bigger, again, than the Dilophosaurus in Jurassic Park. The Dilophosaurus in Jurassic Park, I feel like, are two semicircles, sort of farther back on the head. At least the Brian Ng interpretation of the skull, and I guess would be the modern interpretation because I'm sure he worked with the authors on how to draw it, mm -hmm. starts very far on the tip of the snout, goes up really high and extends all the way back towards the back of the head, basically. Yes. And it's almost more like a mohawk, or like two mohawks next to each other all the way across the head. Except it starts at the front of the, the snout, yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, on our head, right? Yeah. The mohawk starts sort of in front of the head, too. Well, it's unclear what the crests were used for. They would have been too weak to fight with, but maybe they were used for display, like to recognize each other or attract mates. There were air sacs in the bones around the brain, and they're linked with sinus cavities in the front of the skull. And the opening in front of the eye sockets were also linked to the side of the crest, so the crest probably also had air sacs. Yeah, so they might have been hollow. And maybe helped regulate body temperature. The type species is Dilophosaurus weatherili. Three skeletons were found in 1940 in Arizona. Only two were collected in 1942. It took 10 days to collect those two skeletons. Wells said it was a rush job. <laughs> and then they brought them back to Berkeley, the UC Museum of Paleontology. It was Jesse Williams, a Navajo man, who first found the fossils in 1940. And according to Navajo myth, footprints and dinosaur bones were often explained as belonging to monsters killed off by the hero twins who slayed monsters. And when the hero twins slayed a monster, they buried the monster and turned it into stone. Over time, they got rid of all the monsters on Earth, and then people were able to take over. Such a cool legend. It is. Yeah, and they were getting rid of monsters as part of their quest to meet their father. Interesting. There's a lot more to it than that. It's a really cool myth, but I'll get back to Dilophosaurus. <laughs> so, <laughs> so Dilophosaurus, as I said, there were three skeletons originally found, and they were ranged in triangle. The first one was nearly complete. The second one was eroded, but had the front of the skull, lower jaws, vertebrae, limb bones, and an articulated hand. The third one, however, was so eroded it was almost gone and there were only fragments of the vertebrae. So that's why they only dug up two of them. Mm. Just to be pedantic, any three points make a triangle, but I see what you mean. Probably roughly equilateral triangle to say they were arranged in a triangle. Oh, I see. Because you define a triangle by three points. It doesn't matter where on earth they are. Every three things are in a triangle. Not if they were parallel to each other. They'd still be in a triangle. Oh, you mean like if they're exactly in a line? That's true. Yeah. You could technically have three if they're perfectly in a line. Okay. Well. <laughs> You're not interested in the pedantry. <laughs> <laughs> not that particular one. <laughs> so the holotype was nearly complete. It was only missing the front of the skull, parts of the pelvis, and some vertebrae. The skull was crushed. It took three people two years to clean and mount the holotype. So 10 days to dig it up, two years to prepare it. Gotta take your time when you're prepping. Yep. 
Wells didn't think it was a new dinosaur at first, or at least a new genus. Originally, it was thought to be a new species of Megalosaurus, Megalosaurus weatherli, when Samuel Wells named it in 1954. And it was considered to be Megalosaurus at first because they had similar limb proportions, and also Megalosaurus was that wastebasket taxon for a while. Wells also didn't realize that it had crests, because the crests were thin and crushed together and they were thought to be a misplaced cheekbone. Hmm. In 1964, Wells found another skeleton near where the first ones were found that was nearly complete and larger than the holotype. And then he realized there were crests on the skull, so he named Dilophosaurus weatherli in 1970. And he said the crests were as unexpected as finding, quote, wings on a worm. <laughs> <laughs> Interesting. <laughs> so the genus name Dilophosaurus means two-crested lizard. The species name Wetheralli is in honor of John Wetherill, a Navajo counselor that Wells said was, quote, an explorer, friend of scientists, and trusted traitor. Now, interestingly, Wells didn't actually think that that 1964 specimen was Dilophosaurus, even though they both had crests, the 64 specimen and the first two. But he passed away before he could name the dinosaur. And other paleontologists either found no significant differences between the 1964 specimen and the holotype, or they found the differences were due to individual variation or how they were preserved or their different ages. Now, that 1964 specimen is considered to be an adult because of its size, and the first two skeletons found were considered to be juveniles. It's possible that they are juveniles or sexual dimorphism, which seems to be coming up a lot this episode where some are more gracile and some are more robust, although there's no evidence that's been found of sexual dimorphism, though it's possible maybe there were some differences in the crests because we don't know the top of the crests. In 2001, Robert Gay identified at least three more Dilophosaur specimens based on hip bone fragments and different sized femora or thigh bones. They weren't identified till 2001, but they were found in 1978, also near the original specimens, and they'd been labeled as, quote, a large theropod. <laughs> that is vague. It is. But they help fill in some gaps about the skeleton. And some of the bones belong to an infant, which is mm. pretty cool. A 2005 study of the bones found that most Dilophosaurus specimens were juveniles and only the largest one was an adult because the bones were co-ossified. And as I mentioned, Adam Marsh and Timothy Rowe redescribed Dilophosaurus in 2020. Marsh spent seven years studying the specimens. They studied five specimens and they found Dilophosaurus to be a neotheropod. Several more specimens have been referred to Dilophosaurus, but there's not enough features to confirm them, so they're referred to as CF Dilophosaurus weatherli. But it's cool because we know the jaw bones, parts of the skull, including the brain case, the spine, neck, back, and tail bones, parts of the shoulders, arms, hands, hips, legs, and feet. Pretty much the whole animal. Yeah, and most of the crests. <laughs> There was a second species for a while, Dilophosaurus sinensis, named in 1993. It was found in China, but now that's considered to be a Sinosaurus. The holotype of Dilophosaurus had a lot of pathologies, but it's hard to tell how it got them. One possibility is it's from one encounter, like it collided with a tree or a rock while fighting. I remember that paper, talking about all those injuries. Yeah, there are a lot. It's got a groove on a tailbone that might have been from an injury or being crushed, two pits on the right arm that might have been from collections of pus, or they could be artifacts of how it was preserved. There's a smaller, more delicate left humerus or upper arm bone than the right, and a smaller, more delicate lower right arm bone than the left, and that could be a developmental anomaly known as fluctuating asymmetry, which could be caused by stress or pressures in the environment or from traumatic events. Now, all of the injuries, at least, had healed, so the Dilophosaurus seems to have survived for a while after it got hurt, like months or even years. While healing, though, it probably couldn't use its arms well to capture prey, so it might have done a lot of fasting, or maybe it only went after small prey. There are footprints found near where the first Dilophosaurus specimens were found, and they had three toes, so they may have been Dilophosaurus tracks. There were also tracks found in Connecticut in 1966 by a bulldozer operator. They were assigned to Eubrontes, which became the state fossil of Connecticut in 1991. Yeah, usually if you read about Eubrontes, they'll say it's probably from Dilophosaurus or a Dilophosaurus-like dinosaur. Yes. 
That area at the time was being excavated for a state building. And then in 1968, instead, it became Dinosaur State Park. <laughs> <laughs> because they found so many tracks there, they didn't want to put a building on top of it. Exactly. Wells also named the Ichnogenus Dilophosaurus Williamsi, based on Williams, who found the skeletons. There's other tracks found around the world that at times were considered to be made by a dinosaur like Dilophosaurus, but in some cases they could be other theropods or even from sauropodomorphs. There's one resting track considered to be made by a theropod that's similar to Dilophosaurus and Lillian Sternus, and for a while it was considered to have feather impressions, but a 2004 study found that the impressions were pressure release structures caused by when the dinosaur was moved after it rested. So they found that the theropod sat back on its feet, shifted its weight to the right when it stood up and moved forward. But that doesn't mean it didn't have feathers, just that we don't see feather marks because the feather marks would look different. The resting tracks are cool because they show the dinosaur was crouching and using its hands to crouch, and it left some thin drag marks from the end of its tail. Don't get a lot of tail drag marks. No, we don't. Which is partly how we know dinosaurs didn't usually drag their tails. <laughs> so the tracks I attributed to Dilophosaurus in Arizona is known as the Big Lizard Tracks in Navajo. <laughs> That's fun. It is. Dilophosaurus is the state dinosaur of Connecticut as of 2017, based on the tracks that were found there that are considered to belong to dinosaurs similar to Dilophosaurus. The Ubrantes. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Of course, you can see Dilophosaurus in the movie Jurassic Park. Sort of. Well, a version of it. Something named Dilophosaurus that doesn't have much in common with actual Dilophosaurus. It's got the crests. <laughs> yeah, it's true. It's also mentioned in the novel. Though, like we said before, in real life, it wouldn't have spit venom. Probably didn't have that neck frill. And it was way bigger. <laughs> but Sam Wells said it was a thrill to see Dilophosaurus in Jurassic Park and was Quote, very happy to find Dilophosaurus an internationally known actor. <laughs> <laughs> Dilophosaurus lived in a dry area with a waterway lined with conifers. Some other dinosaurs that lived around the same time and place include the armored herbivore Scutellosaurus and the sauropodomorph Cerasaurus, as well as Megapnosaurus and Cayenta Venator. And some other animals that lived around the same time and place include sharks, fish, salamanders, frogs, turtles, lizards, Crocodilomorphs, mammals, and pterosaurs. 